It is sure good to see you all this morning. On this, uh, you know, I just wish fall could last like three quarters of the year. It's uh, before the snows come. I, I I like it better than spring because my allergies aren't as bad. Some of you can relate. I'd rather have the pretty leaves than you know flowers, which make me sneeze. I suppose. But uh, one thing I wanted to pass on to you, um, the pains. Uh, Wanted to be sure and express their thanks for um, so many of your support and prayers um, as you know Nancy's brother has passed away, and we want to pass it on. And I do just uh, please uh, remember that we have our prayer bulletin that's out. I, ho- I hope you have a chance to pick those up and pray for one another. So many of you, I know we've been had a lot to pray for, and so we want to lift one another up, knowing that we need to lay our our concerns before God as well as our praises, and we can both cry with one another and rejoice with one another as as church family. So please take note of those. Take those home. Pray for one another. And also, that's one of the main reasons we have that registration form is so that you can write down your prayer requests that you can throw in in the offering plate because we do want to pray for you and we do want to rejoice with you. And, of course, if there's something, if you just say, hey, just please pray for me, and you don't want to write the details, then, then that's enough. On the other hand, if there's something you want us to know about in the office, but you don't want us to print up, then just mark please for office only, and we won't put it in the prayer bulletin. But we we do want to remember you before the Lord in prayer. Well, we're going to be back in the book of James. So some of you um, and have mentioned that it seems like I'm picking on you when we go through the book, and that's just the nature of the book that we're going through. This is a very practical book. It's very hard to hide from what he's saying. James says things very clearly. He can't say, well, I don't know what he really meant. I don't know if this really applies to me, but he is saying things that should cause us to look in the mirror and go, how do I measure up? How am I? How is my faith? And I don't mean the faith in terms of just a belief or an emotion, but how am I living my faith? And so, once again, he is going to do his best through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to challenge us this morning. Um, Because we're going to circle back to what we we have already covered, that true faith should be evident. If you believe something, you should be able to tell that you have those beliefs by your actions. I I remember as a child, we lived in Minnesota on a couple different times. But I, I remember we would go over to the neighbors and they had this big farm and sometimes we'd eat their berries. And, and it was with the mom's permission, I think. In my memory, it was with the mom's permission. But, and, and sometimes afterward, we'd come up and she didn't have to, have to ask if we'd been eating the raspberries. Right? Our hands were stained red and so were our faces. The evidence was there. We had been in the berry patch. And I, I remember, I think my mom still has a picture of one of my sisters and I and the neighborhood kid because it looked like we had beards, berry beards. And we weren't even trying to decorate ourselves. That was just the natural outcome. It was all of our faces and our hands and our clothing. And, and, we, and we know that in the Bible, if you remember back to when the, when the Hebrews were in the Exodus, that when Moses would meet with the Lord, after being in his presence, his face would glow. There was an evidence on his countenance that he had been with God. And we, in the same way, Christ's radiance should shine through those who are his. Um, our be- no, you're not going to have glowing faces. Okay, I, I've, I've never seen that happen. Your faces aren't going to shine like a flashlight. You're not going to be, become luminescent. But, but our behavior should show an indication that we have been with Jesus, serving as evidence that we, that we are his people. And so we're going to look at this this morning and continue this uh, this talk on faith and works. So if you join with me in James, we're going to be in chapter 2, starting in verse 14. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter. And then we'll come back and, and discuss this some more. But in chapter 2, starting in vo- verse 14, we read, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let's go ahead and pray and ask God to speak to us this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for this passage this morning as we examine it. I pray that that you would give us a right understanding of what you have had written. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and with your Holy Spirit would just give us a clarity of thought. But we also pray, Lord, that you would give us conviction when when it's necessary. And we, you would give us the power um, to put the truths that you will teach us into action. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're looking today a little bit more about the relationship of faith and works. And James is very clear, I think, as we read through this. He says, just as a living fruit tree produces fruit, now that according to its kind, whether that be apples or cherries or pears or plums, so a living faith should produce fruit. And he's just making a very simple statement, really, um, saying, if you have faith, there should be evidence of that faith. He gives the example of helping a brother or sister. And I think we would all agree, before we get any further, that our values should translate into action. I mean, shouldn't they? If, If our actions don't match what our professed values are, you have to stop and ask, are they really our values? Or are they just something we speak? If you say exercise is important to you, I, I don't say that very often. And that's good because my, my actions do not prove that value. I, my values prove that exercise is a good idea, but not a good commitment, right? Um, I, I try to convince myself that running around the base path in softball is exercise, which is not because I don't get on base enough to do any running. But that being said, do your actions prove your values? Do they show what you really believe? And we need to, our actions, of course, should come out of our heart. Now, you can fake behavior to impress somebody because it's culturally expected. And, and James isn't saying your actions are changing your heart. We know that true actions come out of the heart first. But our actions, when we show them, should show what is in the heart. Um, I was thinking again, and I've used this example, I'm sure, many times, but the ring that I wear on my finger does not make me married. But it is an evidence that I am married. In the same way that my actions towards my wife should validate the love that I express with my mouth. Now, if I said I love you but treated her with contempt and belittled her in public and never did anything nice, you'd say, I don't, I don't think love means what you think it means. Because, say, your actions don't match the profession of your mouth. And so what we see, he's saying, you say you have faith. Do your actions prove what you are saying? And see, really, my, our faith is shown real by our actions. I can't look into your hearts. I can't. I can only take you by your word and judge you by what you do. And we don't mean that in, in, in an evil judging. But if somebody says they're a loving person, then I am going to assess by my eyes, by what I watch, whether that's a true statement or not. That's the only way I can judge. Only God knows the heart. If a person shows deeds of charity and mercy, I'm going to assume they have a loving heart, unless unless there's another reason not to. Now, obviously, they tell me, well, yeah, I I don't really care about these people. I just need a better tax write-off. And then I have reason to question. But the, but the Bible does tell us that we're not to judge another man's heart. We are, we are to judge them by their profession and by what they do. 
And the same way James is saying, we should be judged by what we do. Because it should be indicative of a true faith. Um, Rahab is the other example. Remember Rahab? Here she was. She was a citizen of Jericho, a city that is marked for destruction by the Israelites, by God. He sent his people to destroy it. Some spies come in to check out what it's like. And she hides the spies. And she says, we know that your God is God. Please remember me. She has decided to throw her lot in with the Israelites regardless what happens because she knows there's a higher purpose. Now, if she had just said, you know what, I believe in your God, but had provided them no assistance, they'd be like, okay, all right. They would have no true understanding of the faith that was in her heart. They would have no evidence of the faith that was in her heart. But how did she demonstrate that she wanted to follow God by hiding the spies? Does she, is she saved because she hid the spies, because she did this? No. But it was the outward demonstration that she had a real faith. The other people were able to see that she wanted to have a real faith in God. And in our, in our actions will declare us righteous before someone else. Um, that's the way they will be counted. The, the, the word justification is to be declared righteous. Now, we, we do know that ultimately we are going to be declared righteous by the work of Christ because there's nothing that we can do to earn God's righteousness, and we're going to come back to that. And that God, despite all evidence to the contrary, clothes us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is just a miracle and an act of mercy which we can't get past. But living in this world, we will also be declared righteous by those that we see, will we not? Well, they say, oh, you're a Christian. I can tell. Or they'll be like, really? You're a Christian? You know, there's, there's, there's difference. And, and I'm sure all of us have fallen on both sides of that at different times in our, in our walk with Christ, if we've walked long enough. But which way should we walk? Well, we know the answer. And we need to show others where we should be counted. Because there are certainly healthy and correct responses of a true faith. Whereas a dead body can perform no action. A living faith should compel the believer towards action. And and James is saying there's a link here that when we talk so quickly about our faith that I believe, but divorce it somehow from practical living, we're missing out on the power and the life change that faith should provide. And I think we miss that a lot. We know that because we're surrounded by a lot of people in not just here in Utah, but all over this country, who try and are trying to earn their favor with God by what they do. They're trying to say, I believe I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. And so they're putting their faith on their works. And sometimes, because we see that error, we don't talk about works at all. But we need to say, no, works don't save you. But they are an important evidence that you are saved. And so James in the same, po- same passage here seems to be correcting a similar error. Here's people who say, well, well, I did all these sacrifices. I did all these things. And so you see the natural tendency of people to go, well, we don't need to do anything to be saved. And he would say, you're right. But you should do something because you're saved. And so we're, we're going to go on with this. And because there can be some confusion, I want, I want to look at some other verses from Scripture to see that James is not out on the island with this thought, that the Bible clearly affirms that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone with no effort on our own to accomplish this. But it does, at the same time, show that there should be evidence that we have a living faith inside of us. And we start off, of course, in Galatians chapter 2, which is a counterpoint. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus, Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And we could go on in Galatians because Paul is talking to a different crowd. The crowd that thought works was the way to heaven. And he's saying, works will not bring you salvation. No one can fulfill the law. And James, we read last week, anyone who fails at one point is guilty of it all. So guess what? Your problem is not how good you are. Your problem is how guilty you are. And we're all guilty. And there's no amount of good deeds that we can do that could give us favor with God, that could free us from the condemnation. And then when we read this, comparing it to James, if these were the only two verses in the Bible you ever read, 
out of the context. By the way, whenever you read a verse, it's really important to read the verse that's before it and the verses after it. You just pick it out of context. You don't get the full thought. You don't get the complete thought. But we read, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So we see these. Paul is saying, um, a man is not justified by works, and James is saying, faith without works is dead. Is there a contradiction here? Well, well there's not. But we need to add the rest of the sentence. And so we're going to go through, in the context, um, the rest of these verses and the rest of the thoughts from Scripture. James, first of all, is not writing to unbelievers. We understand that, right? He's not writing to people who are saying, well, I don't know who God is, I don't know who Jesus is, tell me how I can know him. He's writing to people, first and foremost, who said, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. But for whatever reason, they say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and since I believe, I don't have to do anything. That seems to be the audience, or at least a, a misconception of the audience. He's saying, well, if you're a follower in Jesus Christ, who's been saved by Jesus Christ, there should be some evidence. See, it's, it's about the audience he's writing to. Um, and Paul here is writing to people who are saying, you have to work for your salvation. So they're writing to a different crowd in, in the same general idea. He's saying, you don't have to work for your salvation. You can't do anything to work for your salvation. But as we, as we go a little further, you're going to see they don't disagree. And we look further in the Bible in these passages. We're going to be very clear, and I know I'm saying this over and over, but because I want you to be sick of me hearing me say it, that you can reiterate it on your own. You know, you're in your sleep at night. Scripture makes it clear, works don't save us. However, our faith should produce works. You know, if you're, if you're saying that at night in your sleep, I've succeeded, okay? So, here we go. Philippians 1.6 says, and we've read, read this many times, because it's just such an encouraging verse, and it's so succinct. But it says, being confident of this very thing, that he, being God, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That God doesn't just save you. He continues to remake you into his image. We are called new creations. And he is, he's doing the outward working of our faith. That he will keep it going. So if he is in us, he's at work in us. What a joy. What a joy. That you don't just have to white knuckle and work extra hard, give up sleep and cry and say, am I, am I good enough? But instead we need to go to God and say, have your way with me. Change me. And of course... There are some actions we need to put into practice. But it is Holy Spirit which transforms us. Well, that sounds a little bit like what James said, doesn't it? If there's an act, if there's an act of salvation in you, God will be working in you. And when God is working, he can leave a footprint. We also read in 1 John, it says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So here's John, another one of the disciples, writing to the Christians saying, if you want to know if you are living obediently, if you are walking in fellowship with God, your actions will show. Um, one, of the, one of my professors said, John, the, the letter of 1 John was, was tests of fellowship with God to see if you're in right relationship. We're not talking to say if you're saved. Although, if none of the evidence matches up, you might want to stop and ask, why that's so? Why is this so? Do I, am I really following Jesus? Sometimes that's an okay question. We don't want you to ask, have to, to doubt your salvation, because that, that's a way over compensation. But we want to make sure that you know who Jesus is and what he's called us to do. And, and John says, if you say you know him, but you don't keep his commandments, then, then you're a liar. If something's lying about you, at least your lifestyle, your actions. You know, in a the works from a changed heart obviously should follow God's saving work in our lives. And sometimes we, we let ourselves off the hook, and I, and I, don't, I don't know why that's true. I, I was thinking as I was writing these notes out, sometimes the word that we use in our culture for being a disciple of Christ, we use the word a believer. And I think sometimes that's a problem. It's a biblical word. I mean, it's not a bad word to use. But it has a different cultural understanding these days than the people who would have originally used it. And, and we use belief as in like just head knowledge, that I, I agree with the facts about Jesus. And that is not at all what the Bible talks about when there's a belief. It's an I believe it 
See, it's, it's a life-changing belief. Because I personally believe that if I jump out of a plane with a parachute on my back, it will save me. <laughs> I'm not jumping out of a pair. I'm not going to put that faith to the test because I'm afraid of heights. And planes, I'm actually not afraid to be in the plane. But jumping out of a plane, it just seems crazy. If the plane's on fire, I'll do it, okay? No problem. Fire, safety. But I'm not, I believe the parachute will save me, but I'm not putting it on. How, how, many, how many people do you know they believe that Jesus existed. They may even assent to the fact that he died for their sins and rose from the grave. But they don't want him to be a part of their life. There are people who know the truth, and they just don't like it. There are people who believe in God, yet they have a deep disdain for him. And, and, and James uses the example of even the demons believe in God. They're not ignorant, but they are opposed to God. There's a difference between believing about and believing in. You know, maybe we should be called followers of Christ. Maybe that would help us to realize that there should be action. Of course, we as human beings would mess that up too, and pretty soon I'd be talking to you about, no, it's by faith you're saved, not works. But whatever, whatever title we give, we as human beings turn to take that to an, an extreme that's wrong. But we need to rethink our words and how we view our faith. It's our, it's our connection with Christ, though, that brings this this work and we look again in the bible and jesus himself speaking to the disciples says i am the vine and you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him bears much fruit and very importantly for without me you can do nothing i, I used to think that was kind of a negative a negative statement without me you can't do anything i'm like okay well what use am i <laughs> right i'm like I, I guess i'm just you know, ornamental uh, uh, in terms of salvation. But I, I also find a, a great, a great joy in this, and a great freedom. That it is God who will work through us. It is God that we are connected to that brings the growth. It is His work through me that can make a real change in me and through me. And I, I don't know about you, but to me, there's 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 a rest in this. Yeah, I can't do it on my own, but you know what? I don't have to. But God is pleased to work in his people when they will yield himself to his work. It's a, there's, a, there's another verse. We, we read this, of course, to, to teach ourselves that we can't save ourselves by our own actions. And it's a really good verse. And this is a part you probably memorized if you grew up in Sunday school classes in a church like this one. But it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Man, I love that verse. It just puts everything in right perspective. And, and, and we do well to learn this. That it is, it is not our work, but it is the work of Jesus Christ that brings salvation. And it is our faith in this free gift. It is a faith in that, that we become transferred from darkness to life. We receive this new birth, that we are born again. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please talk to me, talk to Chris, talk to anyone who is an usher afterwards, because we want to share with you that you can indeed have salvation in Jesus Christ. You don't have to work hard enough. You don't have to be good, good enough. It'll be God who will make you good. It'll be God who changes your heart. We can't do it on our own, and we thank God so much for what he has done in Jesus. But we also should remember verse 10. Because he saves us, he doesn't leave us there. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, our faith, our works don't save us, but our, our faith, our salvation should change us. And that should be evident. I, uh, as some of you know, I, I teach um, on Tuesday nights for the next 11 weeks through CB Matrix, and some of you have come, and it's, we're having a great time digging into God's Word and studying, and we're going through the New Testament. And, and I used this example the other day. Um, I, well, it's an example we use a lot between a caterpillar becoming a butterfly and the change between becoming this you know, ground-dwelling larva to a flying creature that God's created, and the change is marked. Um, just as just as we should be marked when we come to Christ, there's continuity, yes, but complete difference. But if you were to see a butterfly that just refused to fly and continue to walk along the ground, well, it wouldn't be very safe for that butterfly. But you would look at it, 
And you would still recognize it as a butterfly, would you not? I mean, the fact that it can fly does not make it a butterfly. But it is a expected result of being a butterfly. And if you would see this, this insect, this beautiful insect, that would refuse to fly, you'd probably judge that it was either a defective butterfly or an injured butterfly. And the same, th the same thing is true about us. A real faith should produce works. Unless it's not a real faith, or is a defective faith, or an injured or immature faith. And we, we do need to look in the mirror and say, am I who I should be? Now, you'll never be all the way who you should be. It's a process, people. We're growing. And just as when my child was born, both my children, very similar. My wife brings it home. No, I mean, I was, I was with her at the hospital both times, but brings it home and says, isn't he cute? And, you know, as a typical guy, I go, what does it do? I was like, and just poops and sleeps and eats and then poops again. And, you know, and, and she's like, isn't it so cute? I'm like, it kind of stinks. But, you know, you know obviously, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond what I was. I, I loved my sons when they were little. But, you know, as, as a dad, because a lot of men fall in this camp, I was really excited when he started to do stuff. Look, he took a step. He smiled, he crawled, and my, and my wife was like, it's happening too fast, don't wish it away, right? Um, but it's a growth process, and I did not expect my newborn to play ball, right? One, one time, um, when we first moved here, and it's, man, it's been a long time, um, I think Garrett was 18 months when we moved here. Can you, can you believe that? Have you guys seen him run around and not... Stop talking. Um, we went over to Christy's house, and she was watching another child. And the child was about six months younger, about eight months younger than him, and not yet walking. And he's but walking around the edges of the furniture. And Garrett, who's now able to walk, comes up, come here, grabs his hand, starts walking. And the kid just goes, bam, you know. And oops, where? And why? Because it was not yet age appropriate. He had not learned to walk. Now, I'm happy to tell you that that same child walks today and runs and talks. Um, but there, there is a trajectory that should go up. And as we grow in Christ, we, will, we should continue to more and more resemble our Savior. It's, it's not a one instantaneous process. Salvation is. We are saved, boom. Sanctification, that's a word for being made holy. Well, that's a process. But it should be happening. It should be happening. And, and we can only know what a person professes with their mouth, and what we see. And James is saying, it is right that the world would judge us. It is. I know their favorite verse is, judge not lest you be judged yourselves. I understand that's like the only verse that the world remembers from the Bible. It is. But you know what? It's right that they would judge us. We are called to be his witnesses. Should we not have some evidence that our faith is in Christ and we're different? Otherwise, what's the point? If we say we follow Jesus because he's love, but we're miserable, awful people, they should question that. If we say I love you, but I never invite you to church or share Christ with you, they might say it's kind of a superficial love, isn't it? They do right to examine whether they can put their faith in the claims that we are professing. And, and so we should expect that. And when we look in the mirror sometimes, and if there is no evidence of our belief, we should say then there's something lacking. And, and this is what James is saying. Because if there are no subsequent works to salvation, it would lead James to question whether we truly knew Christ or had a real faith. Because something's defective. So, so what do we do with this? What do we do? I mean, okay, we can say, okay, pastor, I think I got it down. I'm not, I'm not saved by my works, but I should work out of an appreciation for God, out of a love for God, because he's working in me, it, it should be evident. But what does that mean on a day-to-day? -day? Well, first of all, put it into practice. If the Bible says it, try and do it. And you're going to need a lot of prayer time, believe me. You know the quote um, that St. Francis said, that preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Well, certainly in our culture today, which has um, forgotten many of the essentials of faith, words are necessary. We need, we need to proclaim it. People don't just know it, the gospel anymore. But our words will be rendered meaningless if our behavior doesn't match. 
at least on some levels. And, and one of the best things, too, when you're talking to people and they say, oh, I don't like Christians, you're, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And you can be, absolutely, we are. And, and it's, it's an opportunity to say, I know that I fail daily. And, and you can able, it's, it's an opportunity to be honest. Don't pretend to be righteous. That's just the most annoying thing ever. Like, yeah, I know. I, well, I don't know what you're talking about because all the Christians I've ever met are just absolute saints. I mean, like, you must not know very many Christians, right? Um, but the thing is, you can say, yeah, I know we're not good enough yet, but we are trying to follow our Savior. And, you know, forgive me for, for being a bad example. Forgive me for failing you. But I will tell you, I'm not who I need to be yet, but God isn't done with me either. You can tell people that. You know what? It, it does help break down some of those barriers. That Just being honest and saying, I'm not saved by being good. But I'm trying to be the person God has made me to be. Um, you know, when you're inside the house, this is another example that I heard a classmate many, many years ago say, if you want to see if the wind is blowing outside, if you're inside. You can't feel the wind because you're inside. You look outside, how do you know if the wind's blowing? You see the leaves on the trees moving or the grass going back and forth. Now, you can make a wrong assumption that Trees caused wind. Because by powers of observation, you could say, well, you know what I found out? You could do a treatise on this. It would be fun. Send it to your science teacher. You'll probably get an F, but they might appreciate the humor. Um, but you say, I have, my hypothesis is trees make wind. Every time they want it to be windy, they start waving their, their leaves, and that creates wind. And like, well, that's, that's absurd, right? Well, every time I've seen the trees wave their leaves, there's a wind. They don't go without the other. Now, we all know that that's just an absolutely absurd construct to say, well, no, trees don't make wind. I'm like, well, my trees do, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe you have some defective trees. I don't know. But if, uh, if we know that the leaves are moving because of the wind, and, and the, sa the same thing should be true in, in us, that our lives should move in response to God's work in us. We're, we're, not, we're not doing it on our own in terms of earning our righteousness but there should be evidence. And remember that people will judge to see, is there a wind? I think it's also fitting for this illustration that the word that the New Testament uses for the Holy Spirit is pneuma, which is also translated wind, divine wind. And when the Holy Spirit, that divine wind, is working in us, we should move. And, and uh, people should be able to judge us by that. Um, and, and praise God that we don't have to struggle on our own, but he is faithful and he will do his work in us. But, but I was, of course, I was, I was writing, and I'm, of course, not talking to you good people, but I'm talking about, you know, about other people in other places, of course. <laughs> Go with it. Why is it that so many Christians are content to do nothing? We've seen this, haven't we? And we, we read the reports and you go, in every, in every average church, 80 per, or 20% of people do 80% of the work. That's a standard. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 80% of the people do 20% of the work. And I don't know if that's true of organizations outside church or not, but it's something that consistently comes up. And, and you'd ask, why, why are so many people content to have a profession of faith but no corresponding evidence? Now, not everyone can do everything. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher and a greeter and, you know, on the evangelism explosion team and a member of Samaritan's Purse and, you know, helping your neighbor mow their lawn and raising your own children and going to a job. You can't do everything. So let me, let me set your minds at ease at that. But there should be some evidence that you're a believer, right? But why are some, some people content to say, my act of being a believer is that I sit in line and listen? Go, well, I think, I think there's supposed to be more than that. And I, I know the Bible would, would agree with that. And, and it goes back to the example we use many times that the church on a given Sunday can so often resemble Sunday afternoon football where you have 50,000 people in need of exercise in the stands watching 22 men on the field desperately in need of rest. <clears throat> and some of you have felt like that, like, I, I need a break from teaching Sunday school class, but no one else will help. So I'm going to keep doing it until I just drop dead. And, and there's been people who, not here, have dropped dead. You know, I mean, it's just maybe metaphorically. And sometimes some of you may feel like the, the little red hen, not chicken little. Last time I said chicken little. Little red hen, you know, doing, I'll harvest the grain, I'll grind the grain, I'll bake the flour, all that. And you know the problem with that is? No, it's not for chicken little, although not chicken little, red hen. I've, the little red hen so much. I mean, it is here and now. When they, when they get a stand before their Savior and hear, well done, great is thy reward. It's for the people who missed out on the opportunity to serve God. Because that, that is a loss. We just don't realize the value of it. 
and James, when he had come to realize that Jesus was a Messiah, it turned his world upside down. His entire life's focus, his goal was changed. And I, I don't think he can understand this. If you believe Jesus is a Messiah, if he has saved you from destruction, then how can there not be evidence? How can you not have joy? How can you not want to serve him? It's just, it does not make any sense. And, and, I, and I hope that we can lean that way too. That we can say, I want to serve Jesus because of what he has done for me. And not just because in response, as if we're now paying God back, but also because his Holy Spirit lives in me and compels me. You know, a, a faith that is neither obedient to the commands of the Savior, nor working to show itself to the outside world, is a speak-only, non-effective faith. But we read in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 5, Jesus' own words saying, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So this, this is a hard passage because none of us are where we should be. And we know that. And we do fall short. And we do thank God that it is by his mercy we are saved, by what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. But let us make every endeavor to live out our faith to live faithfully, that we may be used by God for his pleasure and his purposes. Let's pray. God, we so thank you for your patience with us that so many times we, we fall so short. And not, not just in terms of that we could not save ourselves, but as people who are called to live live by your name, that we, we don't succeed. So we thank you for your mercy and your patience. We thank you for your goodness and your power that you can work through us even when our offerings are small and our strength is little. But I do pray, Lord, that we would be people who love you and follow you and that your work is evident in our lives. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen.